Welcome to In Plain English, a podcast where we discuss scientific research in terms that are accessible to everyone, not just the experts. I'm your host, Jamie Moffa. Before we get started, a few quick reminders and a special announcement. First, In Plain English now has a Patreon. You can find our show on Patreon at Plain English Sci. That's P L A I N E N G L I S H S C I. And help support our show by becoming a patron. When you do, you'll get access to some special perks available only to patrons. But don't worry, the main show will always be free and open access. At the student level of $5 per month, you'll get access to episodes a day early, so on the first Monday of the month rather than Tuesday. At the research fellow level of $10 per month, you'll get early access and bonus content, mostly just the goofy conversations we have while recording that have to get cut out. And at the principal investigator level of $20 per month, you get all of that plus monthly AMAs. Supporting us on Patreon will help the show in so many ways. With enough backers, I plan to upgrade my audio equipment, commission a musician to make new intro and outro music, and pay for transcriptions for all of our previous episodes and all the episodes going forward. So, if you are financially able to, please consider becoming a patron of In Plain English. As always, you can download the paper for each episode at inplainenglishpod.org by clicking on the episodes link in the main menu. We believe in open access science for all, so the papers we choose will always be free for you to download. If you have a question or comment about a previous article, you can submit it under the Continue the Conversation tab. If you are interested in being a guest or presenter for a future episode, you can click on the Become a Guest tab on the website. You can reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Plain English Sci, and subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find your favorite platform by going to our website and clicking on the Where to Listen tab. With that out of the way, on to today's paper. On today's episode, we'll be talking about the surprisingly large contribution that parasites make to their ecosystems. We'll do this by discussing the paper Ecosystem Energetic Implications of Parasite and Free-Living Biomass in Three Estuaries by Armand Kouris et al. Presenting this topic is our expert guest, Abby Kimball. Abby, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Abby Kimball, and I'm a PhD candidate at Washington University in St. Louis, and I work in Dr. David Sibley's lab uh, studying the parasite Cryptosporidium. Cool. And joining Abby for this discussion are our two guests for this episode, Jaquela Fularen and Olienka Idowu. Would you each like to briefly introduce yourselves? Hello, everyone. My name is Jaquela Fularen, and I am currently a research technician in the Giro Lab at Washington University. Hello, my name is Olienka. I am also a research tech. I work in the Marone Concepcion Lab at WashU. Great. And without further ado, Abby, take it away. Okay. Um, so the first thing I wanted to start with was just kind of talking about what you guys think of when you think of parasites. What's the first thing that comes to mind? The first thing that comes to mind when you think of parasites, I would say it's like tapeworm and just gross, disgusting, beware thing. I also think of like, I just like the sensation within is like fear again, along the lines of beware. I think of tapeworms be deathly afraid of them. They're pretty horrific. What about you, Jamie? Oh boy. Well, my parents have a dog, so I think of like heartworms. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the most common ones I usually get are tapeworms, malaria, and heartworms, because I feel like those are the ones that people talk the most about. So how do you guys feel about parasites? Icky. <laughs> I think that, yeah, pretty icky. I think this paper kind of maybe turned me a little bit softer, but yeah, still icky. Yeah, parasites definitely have a bad rep, and uh, being a parasitologist means that you're constantly trying to repair that reputation and make people love them as much as that you love them. So yeah, I think part of the reason why we feel this way about parasites, besides the obvious just natural body horror that a lot of their life cycles elicit, is also just how parasites have been used traditionally in pop culture. So like in horror and science fiction and a lot of dystopian media, a lot of monsters in them are actually based on real life parasites in nature. Um, so a big example I like is, you know, vampires, obviously they suck blood and do you guys have any ideas of like maybe what parasites they're based on? Is a mosquito considered a parasite? Yeah, that's a great, uh, great question. 
Parasites kind of come in two different flavors. Um, they are endoparasites or ectoparasites. So endoparasites are ones that live inside of you and are consistently with you. Uh, whereas ectoparasites can be more transitory and they live like on the skin or in the fur. Um, so yeah, so like ticks, um, leeches, mosquitoes, um, those are all pretty good examples. So another example that I personally love because I think it was the first time that I ever really considered a job in parasitology or the first time I thought, oh, that's so cool, was when I saw the movie Alien. There are um, parasites called xenomorphs and um, they're actually based on a class of parasites called parasitoids. And um, parasitoids are usually wasps or winged insects and um, a lot of them will lay their eggs inside of a living host. And then the progeny will mature and they'll ultimately burst out of the host and kill it, or they'll get the host to jump into water, or they'll even like eat the host from the inside out. And so that's what like the directors have uh, specifically said that that's what they based on, based Alien on, which is really cool. And this is kind of a fun fact about uh, parasitoids, like the concept of parasitoids. Uh, it actually made Charles Darwin an atheist. There's a great quote. So he's writing in his journal. Um, about the fact that he just learned about parasitoids. Um, and I don't know if he was the one who first like um, observed them or what, but he said, I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created parasitic wasps with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. I feel like I'm learning so much already because I didn't know that a wasp was like considered a parasite. So yeah. So what's cool is that not all parasitoids are wasps, but all wasps are parasitoids. So yeah, so we were kind of, I think, talking about this in our pre-recording meeting a bit with zombies too. There are a lot of examples of parasites in nature that basically take over the host's brain and make them do things that they wouldn't normally do. Um, so one example is this uh, parasitic flatworm that infects ants. And once it's ingested, it lodges itself in the brain. And this leads to a bunch of abnormal behavior. Um, and the weird thing is at dusk, the ant will leave its colony, which is pretty weird for it to go off on its own. Uh, but then it also climbs to the tip of a blade of grass and it, uh, hangs on by its jaws and it just hangs there um, until cattle come by and eat it. And then the parasite is able to reproduce within the cow intestine. So that's a pretty wild example. We think of how small an ant is. Yeah. And how small that parasite has to be, but the magnitude at which it will affect this huge cow is like mind blowing me right now. I'm glad you're finally getting the coolness. Does that particular parasite, does it kill the cow or does it just use its reproductive as just um, a way to to mature and then pass in its manure and then do the same thing maybe again? Yeah, so um, that's actually really a good point. So parasites kind of have two different ways that they reproduce. Um, they're either indirect or they're direct. So if they're in an indirect cycle, um, or sometimes called the complex life cycle, that means that they'll utilize multiple different species. So kind of what like you were saying, there are a lot of parasites that will infect snails as a primary host, and then will go on to infect a secondary host, which could be an insect or it could be a frog. Um, and then it will get to its tertiary host, which will be a bird, or in this case, it's a cow. And the tertiary host is where it ultimately wants to get to. That's usually the place where it will do the majority of its reproduction. So the other stages are kind of just working their way from the environment to their ultimate host. Um, and then there are some parasites where they just have a direct life cycle. Um, they'll just immediately go from the environment to their host. So for instance, like hopeworms. So uh, yeah, in that case, they're not trying to harm the cow whatsoever, but they don't care about the ants. They're climbing the, the, the life cycle or food hierarchy. They want to be on the top. Right, yeah. I mean, I think kind of getting at this already, but that's what's so cool about parasites is they're ignored, they're hated, but they are the invisible puppeteers of nature. Like they control, I'd say in a lot of ways, everything. Mm -hmm. They're kind of what keeps really? everything. Um, yeah, so if you think about it, um, we'll kind of talk about this a little bit later maybe, but parasites are really important for controlling top predators. Mm. So an example that I really love is, have you guys heard of uh, Sue the T-Rex at the Field Museum in Chicago? 
So Sue is, um, I'm, I'm not like enough of a dinosaur nerd to know this, but I think she's the most complete T-Rex skeleton that we have. Um, and she's at the Field Museum. So if you ever get to go to Chicago, definitely go there because seeing her in person is amazing. But yeah, so Sue is this massive T-Rex, right? And uh, what do you think she died of? I guess a parasite infection. Yeah, so um, there is a parasite called Trichomonas, which actually like still is around today. It infects um, birds. And it lodged into her jaw. And you can still see the the point where it um, it infected and caused, you know, degradation. It basically made it so she couldn't eat. Oh no. It was a parasite that like messed with her bone. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm obviously not a trichomonas parasitologist, but I believe like they still are, are around in modern chickens. And um, I think they just infect the mandible and uh, cause it to degrade or potentially the immune reaction. Um, could be what gets it to to um, inflame and make it difficult to eat. I'm not sure if the jaw is ultimately where the parasite wants to go or if maybe it just accidentally gets trapped there because you obviously don't want to kill your host, your definitive host at least, right? So yeah, I just like that example because A, it gets at that whole idea that, um, you know, you were just saying about this tiny little parasite can bring down, you know, a giant cow and this is a really great example of that. Um, but also, you know, without that parasite, T-Rexes would just be the king of everything and other species wouldn't be able to thrive, right? I guess this is more of like on the molecular. I think I'm like curious of like how these parasites know where to go. So it's like, are they looking for a particular, like, is there some particular signaling or like they are just like, oh, this is where we got lodged. We'll just stay here. I don't know. I just, I think it's interesting because like you said, like she was, um, it was in her jaw. And then this animal, um, I, I, I think I mainly, or we've mainly learned that um, parasites go for like the gut or the brain or something like that. And so I guess that's just kind of like interesting. Like, um, yeah, the how did how do they know? Yeah, so um, the fact that you just asked me a molecular question brings up a really great point about how, for a lot of the history of parasitology, it's been very veterinary and it's been very like ecology based and maybe some public health. And so molecular parasitology hasn't really been a thing until like maybe maybe like the seventies, um, but even then it wasn't very well funded, and it's been pretty difficult to work on a lot of parasites. Um, for instance, the parasite I work on, we just got CRISPR working in like 2015, 2016. It like the tools are definitely really limited. So a lot of those questions, we don't specifically know the answers to. I do know that there has been a lot of work done on um, Cercaria, which is just a um, stage of a trematode parasite, which is what they talk about in the paper. And trematode parasites are just basically flatworms. Mm -hmm. um, and this life stage hangs out in the water. And when it senses a uh, fish or a uh, tadpole nearby, it will go to them and it will lodge into their lymph buds, actually. They're, they've been done, done a bunch of different studies of how Cercaria know where to go, right? And so one thing they're really sensitive to is light. Mm -hmm. So actually in the lab, if you're trying to study these parasites, you need to get them out of the snail first. And one way to get them to come out of the snail and into the water is just to simply shine a light. And I've actually been in the lab and I've gotten to do this and you can see all the little parasites coming out and floating to the top. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's one way they do it. Um, there's, there's a clear link between something that like the hosts put out in the water, so probably some sort of um, metabolites or something um, that the parasites react to. So for instance, if you have, uh, you put some snails that are infected in water that was not in host, that did not have hosts in it versus water that did have hosts in it, you're gonna have more coming out. So obviously they, they sense something. I don't know if we necessarily know like the molecular mechanisms of that, but to your other point of, you know, how do they end up in the wrong place? Or I always thought of them in the gut. But in wild animals, it is, you cut open a frog, for instance, which I have done looking specifically for parasites, and you find them everywhere. Every single organ, for the most part, has some sort of parasite. And what's kind of cool about that is that each parasite 
kind of claims its niche mm. over the other ones. Mm. So in sharks, for instance, you look at their intestine and every little part of their intestine has a very specific species that lives there because sharks have been around for so long that they've evolved all of these different, or they, you know, they've had all these different parasites evolve to be so specific to them, but they also don't want to compete with each other, that they're in very specific areas. I guess that kind of brings me to the point of the fact that humans don't really have parasites anymore. It's also a good point that we think about parasites in a very human-centric way. We're very selfish and we're like, ew, tapeworms. But of the hundreds of thousands of species of like parasitic worms, I believe only 300 of them are like infectious to humans. And they really range in how much, you know, they damage you. So um, for instance, the hookworm actually seems to be pretty beneficial. Um, it's kind of hangs out in you, doesn't do much. And uh, people who have severe um, autoimmune conditions or allergies um, or even Crohn's, they have started to infect themselves with hookworms. Um, it started with one crazy doctor who infected himself just as a test. But now it's actually like funded research studies that they're looking at potentially giving people it's kind of like probiotics, yeah. like pro-parasites, basically, in order to cure these autoimmune conditions. Do you, um, I, my next question was, how does like parasitology like eventually relate to medicine? Um, since I think we all want to go into, well, yeah, a lot of us are interested in medicine. I just, that's really interesting to, to know that people do that. I also thought like, okay, so we seem to separate parasites from what I would consider like microbiology micro like your normal flora and stuff like that and so maybe not in terms of like humans but like in animals could that be argued that some parasites would be part of their normal microbiome yeah yeah I think it's really funny um because like I've been in the microbiome world or at least adjacent to it for so long that I remember when we just had microbiome and now we have all these like cutesy things like virome, the mycome. <laughs> like the <laughs> people are finding all these different um, things. And so I think why there isn't one in humans, like it's not really studied is because we just don't have parasites anymore. But in like wild animals, Absolutely. And so that's what's really weird about parasitology as a field because like it's it's so divided in a lot of ways. You've got ecologists and veterinary people, you've got the public health and the doctors, and then you've got the molecular biologists, and they don't talk to each other at all. So how an ecologist thinks about yeah, diversity of parasites in an organism is completely different than how like a medical doctor or um, a molecular biologist think about it. Sorry, what was your question? In wild animals, could we consider parasites, you know, part of their normal flora? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it's completely abnormal. Like, I will tell you, I worked in a lab in undergrad where all we did was just dissect wild frogs and wild fish. And y y you don't get one that doesn't have some sort of parasite in it. And it's usually a ridiculous amount of parasites. Um, so we are the weird ones. <laughs> And um, we might think of that as progress, like, ooh, cool, we don't have parasitic diseases. But um, I was kind of talking about this earlier, but that is why we probably have um, this rise in autoimmune conditions, because parasites have been absolutely instrumental for our evolution of our immune system. But now that we live in such clean conditions and because we don't really let our kids like play in the mud we're seeing that it's kind of turning on us. So we're having, you know, hyper intense immune reactions to things like pollen or nuts um, because they look like parasites potentially. And so you get a, a parasite-like immunological attack. I planned on letting my kids play in the mud though. <laughs> yeah, no, they've done some really cool studies looking at like kids who grew up on farms versus kids that didn't and like usually they don't have as many immune autoimmune conditions so we were saying like how like you dissected all these different fish and how they all had some type of parasite in them and there were like just a lot of them there then i was just thinking what happens when people like eat fish like 
our bodies just don't house them anymore because we've been so clean for so long. How is it that we eat all these things and then we just don't get because there have been very strict laws <laughs> that has made it impossible. So um, there have been some pretty horrific, um, well, horrific for the first world uh, parasite outbreaks or whatever from sushi restaurants. So um, that's a big one where you'll get like a cyst in your sushi um, and then you'll come down with a parasitic infection. Um, and so now obviously you can't cook sushi. So they have strict rules about having to like freeze it to a certain um, degree before. So yeah, I think that's the main way. We also have like pretty good antiparasitics to a lot of diseases that are common and are more common in the first world. Um, like worms are fairly easy to treat. I, I do not eat sushi for that reason. Um, there was a video on Facebook and someone zoomed in on their sushi and saw a little white thing just going in and out of the raw, you know, fish. And I was like, yep, that's exactly why I only stick to veggie rolls. Yeah, that's a good call. I mean, like undercooked meat in general is also bad. Um, was it fatal for anyone? No. No one, like that's, okay, so this might move to the next point. Parasites, it's also a bit weird because it's not, it's not really like mm, viruses or bacteria to some extent where they're hard to treat. A lot of times it's just that parasites infect and kill poor people. They, it, you know, kill people who are in developing countries and it doesn't happen as much in developed countries. So for a lot of parasitic diseases, it's mostly just like public health. Um, you know, if you have good waste management and you have good water treatment, a lot of pretty like common parasites you'll just kind of avoid. Um, and there are some exceptions like malaria is legitimately difficult to treat. And so is toxoplasma and cryptosporidium, the one that I uh, work on. But parasitology in general is kind of a exercise in classism to some extent. Hmm. I will say this is kind of gross, but my mom and my parents are Nigerian. Um, she says that some of her childhood memories is them giving them spoons full of like, I want to say a type of oil and it would make them excrete worms and you would see it in the poop and they would do it. They would do it every few months, maybe as a kid. And yeah, I was like, yeah, that's not something I would like to see. But she was like, it was pretty normal to do. I've always heard of like, so like my grandmother like tells me stories of like eating old candy. When she was young, you eat old candy and then they would like see like, I guess parasites in their poop. And they're like, oh, and they used to give them something and it would like flush out all of the parasites at once. And I, I can't remember what she said it was, but I was like, I guess that kind of goes with like treating them is pretty easy, at least those in old candy, I guess. I mean, I will say that because um, I don't want to be out of a job, so I don't want to say they're super easy to treat. Because a big thing about uh, developing drugs for parasites is that they're eukaryotes, just like us. And so finding drug targets that are specific for them that don't have any, um, you know, similarities to us is actually pretty challenging to do. And I think a major reason why we have a lot of antiparasitics that have been around for so long and that we use that are pretty effective is because there's not a ton of evolutionary pressure on it because there aren't a ton of people that are infected. So I think the fact that there are low incidences for the most part in places where they're being treated probably contributes to not seeing a lot of, you know, resistance. But there is a lot of resistance in malaria for instance. Um, and that's kind of why they have to always come up with new drugs. What's the closest related parasite, if you know, to like human? Well, um, so I guess that kind of brings up a good point about <clears throat> the diversity of parasites because parasites vary in size. So um, you've got like leishmania parasites, which are like two microns long. And then you have uh, the blue whale um, tapeworm. You guys should guess. How long do you think the blue whale tapeworm is? Well, I'm pretty sure it's a few feet long. I was going to say maybe like, I'm going to say a random number of seven meters. It's 130 feet. Wait, so this parasite is that large. Like, is it ever just like floating around in the ocean? Like how? Probably not. Ta tapeworms are pretty committed. Okay. So tapeworms stay in you and they cannot survive without you. Mm. They'll produce eggs, um, but they can't.
get out of you um, without dying. So the eggs are ingested by other whales? It is eggs in the water. And then a crustacean eats the eggs and then it develops into a larva, into a smaller fish, and then a bigger fish will eat it. And then I guess maybe, I, I don't know how it gets to the whale. Got it. When you um are in the field or like, you know, they were in the paper, they were dissecting um, all of this stuff. I ha- actually have a few questions, but like, how do you guys keep yourself safe from like not being infected with these? Like, what's your PPE or if there is like, preca- you know, precautions? Because, yeah, I'd say like, it's really weird because I did my training in ecology and evolutionary biology and I did a lot of my undergrad research in that. And then I immediately went to the molecular side. Yeah. And they're so different. And so you just saying PPE just made me laugh because there's no such thing as PPE. When you're doing field work. That's scary. Yeah. Well, I mean, you're not working with any, like if you were to do like Lyme disease studies, obviously you'd be decked out, but at least like the, the parasites that they're looking at in this paper and the parasites that I was always looking at, they're wildlife parasites and they don't usually end up in humans. Got it. Um, obviously you don't want to walk around with your bare feet potentially, but no, I think you're probably pretty safe. They measured the biomass in three estuaries. How did they come up with the criteria of like where they were going to take these? How did they choose the estuaries or? So I know just from personal experience that a lot of it is like where you can get permits. Mm. Um, So for instance, like in Colorado, there are a couple sites, which is where I'm from. There are a lot of sites that multiple ecology studies will use. Um, Because A, they have like a thriving wildlife. So for instance, estuaries are really popular because they're partially enclosed and they're usually like coastal um, and they have a mix of salt water and fresh water. So that's like a perfect environment, right? Because you've got a bunch of different organisms, you've got a bunch of different plants, you've got a bunch of different birds. So I think that's why estuaries are really popular um, in California in particular. But yeah, no, there are just be sites that you can get permits for to go to go study um and so that's usually kind of how it's done but uh, that's also why they did three because obviously you could have one estuary that just has like a really weird food web for whatever the reason um i think they they usually try to pick things that are really far away from humans too obviously because we screw everything up uh when i was going on the rant about the whale tapeworm I was trying to answer a question about what's the closest thing to humans, right? Okay. So they vary a lot in size, obviously. That's pretty dramatic. Obviously, a tapeworm is probably way closer to us um, than the single-celled parasites. So that's the other thing, too. Parasites can be single-celled or they can be multicellular. And how they reproduce, like um, tapeworms have ovaries. They're hermaphrodites, so they can reproduce within themselves. So yeah, I mean, I guess if I had to say probably a tapeworm, But evolution always confuses me because then you'll look at a phylogenetic tree and you'll be like, what? (laughs) So who knows? Genetically, morphology wise, um, I'd probably probably say tapeworm. Are nematodes related to trematodes? Yeah, I mean, they're they're similar because I believe they're both multicellular. They look fairly similar. I think they're about the same size. So yeah, they're pretty related. But I mean, when we're talking about parasites, it's kind of weird because like they're all pretty distantly related from each other too, Mm -hmm. just because they've been around for so like so long, so much evolutionary time and um, parasites just adapt so uh, quickly and specifically to their hosts. So one example that I really like is um, actually about tapeworms. Apparently, that's all we're talking about. So they have the their mouth parts is they're called a scolex, and so um, there are some really, in my opinion, beautiful images um, of electron micro, uh, microscope images of their scolexes, and they all have a bunch of different shapes. So some of them hold on to their hosts like with hooks. Some of them have like a sucker like apparatus. Um, some of them even have like a pseudo velcro way of stay, uh, staying on. And so there's a huge diversity in the scolex heads. And that's obviously because they have to specifically evolve to every single host. So, you know, a tapeworm that comes from one species of shark might look different in another species of shark. In regard to the paper, when collecting, dissecting, I guess, animals and the plants used in the study, what did it mean by like wet mass? As we know, like humans are like, what percent are we of water? 70. So like, obviously water is a really big part of our weight. 
So some ecologists do dry weight, which is when you put the, spe the um, specimen in an oven, basically, and you just desiccate it. So you're, you're not accounting for any of the water when you account for the weight. Um, versus wet weight is when you don't do that. And obviously there are pros and cons to both. Which are, like, why would you want to not do, like, why did you guys pick to do the wet mat? Well, I didn't do this. It's probably just for convenience, I'm guessing, uh, because that's really annoying to have to desiccate a bunch of different things. I don't really know. I'm sure there is a very specific debate in ecology about which one's better. Something that I, I was thinking when I read this was how did they measure the parasite's weight? Because some of them are like teeny, teeny, tiny. I think they said... Oh yeah, we estimated parasite biomass in our samples by multiplying species-specific estimates of individual parasite mass by their abundance in individual hosts. We obtained the masses of most metazoan parasites by directly weighing individuals or by estimating their mass by multiplying an estimate of their volume by a tissue density of 1.1 grams per milliliter. So yeah, I guess I should talk about the paper a little bit now that I've convinced you that parasites are super awesome. The context of when this paper came out is that parasites are often completely ignored in ecology. I think that's always been assumed that they're pretty negligible in terms of biomass because they're so small. Um, until recently, we kind of just thought they were negligible in general in food webs and uh, bioenergy. And so this paper was kind of one of the first ones that really showed that you know, on a large scale study that this really isn't true. So overall, the conclusion is that even though parasites are invisible, they are a significant source of biomass in three different ecosystems. Kind of why this matters is that the fact that there are so many parasites in an ecosystem really helps to um, increase the complexity of food webs. And the more complex a food web is, the more stable it's gonna be. It also facilitates interactions. So we were kind of getting at this with Sue a bit, not with Sue, sorry. We were kind of getting at this a bit when we were talking about how parasites will uh, manipulate um, their intermediate hosts to be preyed upon by their definitive hosts. So it really allows predator prey populations to interact more than they would normally if there were no parasites present. And like what we were talking about with Sue, it also um, helps to keep top predators regulated in check. And they talked a little bit about parasite castration, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's when a parasite either destroys uh, the sex organs. So for instance, in a lot of snail species, when the cercaria are inside of them, it literally just destroys um, their, their sex organs. Or um, it can just um, prevent them from reproducing or mating or maybe make them so they're not interested in mating uh, whatsoever. Uh, but it can also do this thing called brood parasitism, which uh, maybe you guys have heard of the cuckoo bird before. No. Ah, so they'll go to a nest that already has eggs in it of a different species and they'll actually... Uh, lay their eggs in it instead, then their eggs will hatch and their progeny will push the eggs of the actual children out of the nest. And their eggs are usually like they've evolved to look exactly like the parents' eggs, so they can't tell the difference. And then they'll sit there and they'll force the parents to keep feeding them and the parents don't realize that it's not theirs. So that also limits fecundity, right? Because their genes are not being put back into back into the system. So, which is a crazy concept about the parasites because I know they're like, oh, if it's a parasitic relationship or like in regards to like symbiosis, it's like you have the ones that are like, I'm gonna kill the host. That's the goal versus parasites that are literally just trying to survive. So they want to like, you know, not kill their host, but manipulate them in their ways that they see fit. And I think that was like another like connotation that I had about parasites, that the end goal is to kill the host when that's not the case, apparently. And I just think that that's, that's pretty cool that it's not all about just killing the host. But I like that they, they kind of like force the environment to just kind of be an environment and having like prey you know, interact with the predators and stuff like that and just keep the ecosystem like cycling, I guess. So that's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah. And check and balance. Yeah. They're the peacekeepers. <laughs> it kind of makes sense, right? Like why would they want to kill their host? That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Right. So parasites really have to balance this whole like lethality um, factor um, with, 
you know, being able to maintain and keep their hosts around. Yeah, so I think the big takeaway from this paper is that um, they quantified all of the parasites within the ecosystem, and they found that parasites exceed that of top predators in terms of biomass. So in some cases, it's been more than 20 times. Definitely there. <laughs> yeah, and there's also so much diversity too, right? There are like, hundreds of different species that they describe um, in this paper. So I don't know if the, the methods or the specific results are as important as just the concept, that they're obviously very significant um, to ecosystems and that they're important to keep studying. I think another thing I kind of wanted to talk about is climate change and how it's changing uh, parasites and their ecosystems. So obviously, hopefully you guys now have a sense that parasites are really specifically adapted to a specific host. Um, and so when that host quickly disappears, the parasite is going to disappear too. It's not going to have enough time to evolve and change um, just because it's been spending thousands and millions of years specifically adapting to that host. And when that parasite disappears, there's going to be a butterfly effect within the ecosystem. So like we've been talking a lot about predator and prey, if, um, you know, a really good example is the I think I talked about it a little earlier, but the horse hair worm, uh, which infects the crickets and it makes it so it kind of just jumps around and eventually goes near water and will jump and fall into the water. So it turns out that crickets are like a major source of food for fish. And so if that parasite is no longer there, not only is the cricket population going to shoot up, which will probably be a problem for other reasons, but that those fish populations that are relying on them for food are definitely going to go down. So yeah, parasites just kind of have this total butterfly effect in an ecosystem and it's because they're so connected um, and they connect so many different species. So yeah, and I think another thing about climate change is, you know, parasites are very understudied as I was kind of saying, like we kind of just started looking at them pretty seriously molecularly, like, you know, only 50 years. So there are probably plenty of spe species that we'll never know existed and we'll never get to study. And um, that kind of sucks because they've come up with some really dramatic ways to survive that we're never going to be able to study those mechanisms. And as parasite species in general just get less diverse, there's going to be less competition between the parasites. And so that's going to mean that um, specific parasites and perhaps like human specific parasites that are really deadly to us, they're going to flourish. And, you know, spillover might occur as animal parasites will start to have the pressure to evolve to the only hosts that will be left. And that will be us. Another important point is that because it's getting warmer, a lot of the insect species that carry leishmania and malaria are actually starting to move away from the equator and into the first world. And a lot of us have never had any sort of parasitic infection before, so our immune system won't be able to recognize it. And as we've established, we don't have fantastic drugs um, in order to deal with, you know, a full-on pandemic. I guess, well, it's not the greatest, but if you carry the sickle cell trait, maybe better off than people who don't. Yeah, I mean, but that's like a, that's fairly specific, right? To like Africa or, yeah. Around the equator. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a perfect example of how host and parasite are constantly evolving and pushing each other to develop ways to outwit each other. This may be a reach, but um, in evolution, we kind of learned that like historically, we always like think of humans as like the top and just every, like you said, everything revolves around us. But like, honestly, there is no like, oh, we're better than so-and-so because we all are interconnected and there's a lot of things that we don't see that we still rely on that will eventually affect us. Yeah, I mean, I think the way we think about climate change, too, is like we see these you know, massive animals going extinct. Like we see polar bears going extinct, but we don't know what – I mean, a lot of species on Earth have just never been characterized, so we don't know what we're losing. And I think it was funny that you, you brought up like, oh, we're the top or whatever because – an analogy I always kind of like to talk about is with the Lion King, with Circle of Life. You know, I think that that's a really good demonstration of basically how trophic levels work, right? You've got the 
antelope that eat the grass, and then you've got the lions that eat the antelope. Um, but when you think about all of those animals in the opening scene, they also have a ton of different uh, parasites. So like the lion, for example, is the top of the the food chain. But in one study, they found that lions have like 20 different species of parasites on them. I was going to ask, like, how do you think we get rid of that negative stigma associated with parasite? I mean, when I when you just say parasite, like people even use it like, oh, that person's a parasite. They just leech and all, the, you know, like it's just such a bad, it just has such a bad notion attached to it. It's like, Will we ever get from under that, like, you just assume the worst with a parasite? I mean, I think, um, kind of to your point, too, the, how we use language with parasites is really weird. Ecologically, parasitism is just a symbiotic relationship. And symbiotic just means closely together. It doesn't, I feel like sometimes we think about it as being good, and it's not. But it's just a symbiotic relationship where... Uh, one organism is causing harm to another one and the other organism isn't getting any benefit and it's not neutral for them either. So that's kind of the simple definition, but we, yeah, we use it colloquially all the time. And there's kind of a controversy about what a parasite is. So for instance, some purist would say like, uh, fungi, viruses, bacteria, they're not parasites. But what they do is kind of exactly what that definition says, where they're harming a host in order to benefit themselves. So there's a little bit of controversy about what specifically a parasite is. The rules that I usually go by is that they're a eukaryote, eukaryotic organism. They require a host for survival. And that doesn't mean that they have to be in the host all of the time, but that does mean that they, you know, either need the host's blood, for instance, in order to feed, or they need a host for reproduction in the case of the wasps. Um, and then the last point is that they always cause some sort of damage to the host. So by that definition, fungi could, could be that, um, but I don't really know if there are any fungi that always cause damage to the host, so. So should a virus be considered a virus? Yeah, so there's a big controversy about if viruses are even alive. I'm not a virologist, so, <laughs> but a lot of people argue that like they aren't capable of independent replication and they don't like generate their own energy. Apparently that's kind of where we draw the line. That's kind of a philosophical question, I suppose. Sometimes they go hand in hand because again, like when you hear a parasite, you're like, run away. And then when you hear virus, run away. Like, and I think casually you almost kind of combine them. But then now I'm like, but what do I think of? What's the first thing that comes to mind when I think of virus, which is COVID now, but like COVID is definitely not a tapeworm, but I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think that they're the same, but I feel like there are, like if you made a Venn diagram, I feel like they would have a lot of, you know, similarities. I don't know if I would consider them the same. I think like the whole our virus is alive is like what's like my like stopping like are they or are they just I don't know. But I agree, I agree with what Jaquela said like the, the Venn diagram would be like definitely overlapping a lot um, considering like damage or like you know having to use a host has to you know, um, I don't want to say hijack, but essentially so, um, DNA, you know, replication mechanisms to make sure that like their genetic material is packaged again, you know, so I guess you could say they are. That's a loaded question. <laughs> I'm going to say we're on a slippery slope. I also just wanted to read this quote that parasites make up the majority of species on earth. According to one estimate, parasites might outnumber free living species four to one. In other words, the study of of life is, for the most part, parasitology. But I mean, that makes sense because if the, I mean, the numbers are kind of the same, but you were saying like when they did the, um, in like the, in the paper, when they were doing the study for like doing the dissections for that, they found that the parasites were like, outnumbering the mass or the wet masses by like fold at some of them more if you keep and that was only in the three areas I was only three and it was so significant there but it's like imagine all of the 
regions and spaces and locations and environments that we have no idea but the parasites are there well they also made the point in the paper that you know they didn't dissect every single animal so they had to sometimes make assumptions and that probably means that it's even more underestimated the fact that it outnumbered the birds was like i was like do you know how many birds there are and for the parasites and then it's it's just blowing my mind because i'm like it's a parasite i need a microscope to see it like that's just what i think and i'm like the fact that it's outweighing an entire bird it's kind of gross because now i'm thinking of like an anthill but i'm like that's it's pretty cool to just know something that we know now definitely probably leading us into a better place in regard to like science especially with like the climate change and being more prepared for the change in like parasites is i guess like abilities and abundance and stuff like that kind of scary but at least now we know that they are there in abundance, so we need to be prepared, even though we are relatively clean and don't have to worry about them. But in regard to like the flora and fauna of the world, I guess, being mindful of the other things here on Earth with us. Well, it's kind of weird too, because like when you think about endangered species, what we do is we usually like put them into breeding programs, right? So we can keep them safe. But I don't, we can't, I don't know what we do (laughs) in order to preserve parasites. I mean, I guess you could try to keep their hosts, um, you know, preserved. But when you're taking them out of their natural environment, like that is going to screw up with the cycle, you know, their life cycle. So I don't really think there's a way to preserve parasites. Do you think that the field ecologists and other people that study different aspects of of parasites, do you think eventually they will merge? Are you starting to see that field kind of like start talking to each other? Is everybody still like, no, I don't like this or, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's just like, they're just so different, even at the undergraduate level, that usually if a school has explicit degrees in molecular and ecology, like they're going to be completely different. At least where I went to undergrad, there was really no overlap. And so I knew from a very young age that I wanted to try to bridge the gap between them. But it's really hard to talk between the two sides just because their methodology is so different and how they think about questions is so different. And the funding is super different because unfortunately kind of all we care about is human health. (laughs) And human diseases. So getting, um, you know, funding for ecosystem studying or like wildlife studies or whatever is definitely really difficult. But yeah, I'm hoping that they'll be bridged a bit more. I think the microbiome um, explosion has actually been a big contributor to that because microbiome studies all started in ecology. They're the ones who first came up with all the methodology um, and just came up with the concept in general. And so now molecular biologists are kind of seizing on it and they're having to learn things like alpha diversity and beta diversity, which is like a very ecological thing that now they're kind of having to to practice as well. So yeah, we'll see. I mean, hopefully, knock on wood, maybe I can bridge the gap a bit. I kind of wanted to know, um, before we get too far from the subject of like, what is a parasite and how did we count parasites? In the paper, they like sometimes counted whole snails as parasites. Why did they do that? And did they count them with their shells on? <laughs> Ooh, that's a good point. I mean, probably yes, with their shells on, I'm guessing, because it's really hard to get the shell off. Like you can crush, like when they're dead, you can crush them and kind of pick the shell away. As someone who has crushed many a snail, <laughs> I say this with absolute authority. It's kind of hard to do. So they probably did keep the shell. Um, And so the point of why they did whole snails, which I also agree at first, I was like, hmm, Um, but their rationale is actually really good because like I was talking about with parasitic castration, those snails are, are castrated by those parasites. And so the explanation there is the snail is no longer able to reproduce, but the parasite is able to reproduce. So their, I guess, rationale is that the parasite is replacing them phenotypically, which is kind of interesting philosophically when you think about it. Kind of makes sense to me biologically, like if you think about it in a very Darwinian sense of if you can't reproduce or if you're reproducing in one direction, then you're becoming one of those species. To become another species. Well, I mean, I guess we can think about alien, right? So like 
if you're a human doing human stuff, but then you get infected and the chest burster comes out of you and it goes on to have more chest burster babies, but you don't, then. Well, you're also dead, but the snail's still kicking around. Yeah, potentially, but like they're a reproductive dead end. So I don't know. I guess that brings us to the question of what does it mean to be alive? And biologically, it's probably the best definition has to do with reproduction, I would guess, like your ability to pass on your genes. That's super weird from a like people perspective, because like we totally wouldn't think that way about people or we shouldn't. I was like, if there's someone that can't have children, are they but they're not alive? They can't reproduce. I mean, I guess ecologically, I mean, they can still be a host potentially. So they're still relevant, I guess. I don't know. I mean, they might have also been choosing specific species that are infected with parasites that kill them. The The ones I always worked with, the snails were pretty much fine. I'm curious as to out of like the plethora of parasites that exist, how many lead to castrated hosts? Like what percentage of them lead to that? And that's kind of scary. Like if it's like half, it's like there's like a whole population of say like frogs infected by this particular parasite that castrates them all. And those frogs will go extinct. I'm pretty sure that the only examples I've ever heard about parasitic castration are in mollusks. So usually snails, because I think it's just, it's not even necessarily that the host is, or the parasite's trying to make it so they can't reproduce. I think it's just the mechanism that they go through the tissue destroys their reproductive organs. There are parasitic castrators that are actually barnacles that castrate crabs, though that, I guess, could maybe be an argument of if that's a parasite or not. It's obviously having a parasitic relationship, but um, that's definitely not something that I would immediately think of when I was thinking of what is a parasite. But yeah, what percentage of them are parasitic castrators? So yeah, like I said, I think it's pretty much only mollusks, but that is like a really large portion of a primary host. Like that's a pretty common primary host in parasites. So it's probably pretty high, but it's always our selected species. So there's a lot of them. I don't think that would be a very good strategy if you were to uh, castrate a K-selected species that you needed to complete your life cycle. <laughs> Don't go castrating elephants. But like, because now I'm like catching an elephant. I would hate that. But like, if someone like dissected an elephant, like how much of its mass would be overthrown by parasites? I'm sorry to say this, but I'm sure someone has done that. At least with like a whale or a shark. Like same with the shark. You were like, the entire intestines were occupied by par- like different parasites and different parts of it or segments of the like intestine. I'm like, now I'm thinking about the, the poor elephants. <laughs> yeah, I was just seeing if there was an easy answer and I don't really see one. Okay, so yeah, just anecdotally, like I have dissected many a frog <laughs> trying to count for parasites and you like open the frog up and every single organ has it. So the lungs have fluke worms basically the intestines have you know tapeworms they have pinworms like the amount of parasites just in one frog is absolutely astounding and it can tell you a lot about what the frog did and like where they were um like what they ate which is super cool that sometimes like the parasites that are inside something can be really informative of their life i wonder if there's like a parasitology meets archaeology well, I mean, that's kind of what Sue was. Like, they, they were always wondering, oh, how did she die? How did she die? And then someone looked at the jaw and they were like, oh, that looks just like chicken jaws when they die of trichomonas. Obviously, there's no way to confirm it, but... It's a pretty good guess. Well, because she doesn't have any, like, any other abnormalities, so it was a mystery for a long time. Well, but like, also, I bet parasites, or you said parasites, were, like, a pretty big part of human evolution. So, like, the intersection of parasitology... And like human archaeology. Yeah, I mean, so there have been a lot of studies where they've looked at feces that has been fossilized from like Vikings, and they've been able to find what specific parasites they had. And so that's kind of informed them about their diet or their hygiene or whatever else. Um, They've also found a bunch of parasites in Egyptian mummies. Um, Yeah, and in terms of like human evolution, you know, I think I've already kind of touched on this, but they trained our immune system. Like they were the original microbe that trained our immune system. We have a lot to thank to them for that as well. Maybe that's how we got to the 
off of the food chain. I'm using cultivation. Parasites guided us there and then we got rid of them. And they will be our downfall. Uh, well, there's a great Carl Zimmer um, quote. And he, if you, if this conversation has made you want to learn more about parasites, this book, Parasite Rex by Carl Zimmer is really, really good. But he's got this great quote where it's like, humans are in fact parasites upon the earth. <laughs> Like the idea that we're all parasitic to some extent. Oh, I have another fun fact. So you know, like the medical symbol, it's like the staff of Asclepius with the worm wrapped around it. Or sorry, not the worm, snake. the snake. Well, people think that it actually comes from one of the earliest parasite extraction techniques in ancient Greece where they used to, so I think I talked about the guinea worm already, but basically it's got a direct life cycle it needs water, but then it also needs the human host to reproduce. And so once it's in the human host, it starts to grow into this really, really long worm. And the only way to get it out is that you have to, um, it will start poking its head out and it will actually try to get you to go to water. It'll have a burning sensation. It wants you to get to water and put your, your limb in the water so then it can come out and it can uh, lay its eggs. So when its head starts to stick out, doctors used to wrap the worm around a stick. Its head is sticking out of where? Like the limb, like a wound in your limb. So yeah, so they'll wrap the start of the parasite around a stick. And then every day the doctor will turn the stick a little more and pull it out a little bit more. And this takes like days and weeks because you don't wanna just like pull it out and risk ripping it. Because if you do, there's gonna be a massive like immune response to all of the stuff that's coming out of the worm. So this whole symbol, and I encourage you to look it up, the guinea worm, the symbol they think comes from this whole practice. The guinea worm is either almost eradicated or is completely eradicated. One would hope that it's gone. Well, because it's really easy because it's just, you just have to make sure that people don't drink infected water. But yeah, Jimmy Carter uh, led a foundation to try to eliminate guinea worm and I believe it is so in 2020 there were 27 cases so it's pretty close to being eradicated just another thing that we couldn't eradicate in 2020 yeah that's a good point so yeah there used to be a website that someone started that was called like save the and it was like an authentic plea to preserve the guinea worm and I used to make fun of it but now I don't yeah so I guess if we want to wrap up do we just want to talk about how we feel about parasites now now that we've talked about them, the connotation or the visceral um, sensation about them is definitely better. I don't, I, I don't think I should be like afraid of them in terms of like life. I love that they just encourage life to go on and kind of like are really necessary part of the life cycle. So that's always fun. Um, I like just the life cycle, I like life, um, I like living. We're all connected, man. Yeah, I love that. And it just, it just feels better to have one less thing to be like terrified of. Like that, that's a nice sensation to have. It's true. Yeah, you will not die of a parasite. Like you will not die of a parasite in the first world. I can promise you that. I can't promise you a lot of things, but I can promise you that. I enjoy that. I enjoy that. But yeah, I feel much better about them. I'm definitely in a better position to spread the word and put out know, parasites in plain English for people that feel like how I felt prior to this conversation. Yeah, I feel the same. I think, um, I mean, I'm not like sold, like I will go out in the field and look for them. But I think that, I think that now I think I'll be a little bit more careful about how I use the word, like just in passing or, um, you know, kind of changing my view again, like how we look at like the, in relation to ourselves, like, we're just like, humans are the best and parasites are crappy. And no, it's kind of quite the opposite, really. I'm just more interested. So lately we've been learning a lot how like the gut microbiome affects like brains and and like emotions in the nervous system and like neural function and all of that. So I'm kind of wondering like humans in the first world don't really get a whole lot of parasites, but like how did parasites affect the human brain and like what 
part like what might be different now that we don't have that kind of relationship like i'm super now i'm super curious about that it's like neuroscience and parasitology and archaeology sorry real quick there is something called neuro parasitology which is an emerging branch of science that deals with parasites that can control the nervous system of the host and on that excellent note thank you all for joining us for our eighth episode of in plain english we have been discussing the paper Ecosystem Energetic Implications of Parasite and Free-Living Biomass in Three Estuaries by Curus et al. With our expert, Abby Kimball, and our guests, Jaquela Falaren and Olayinka Idowu. You can download the paper for free on our website at inplainenglishpod.org. Make sure to subscribe to In Plain English on Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and tune in next month for another episode of In Plain English. Thank you.